March 9, 1992 Observer Newsletter Patterson and Garvin resign amidst scandal WWF Reeling, and more awards By Observer Staff World Wrestling Federation Vice President in Charge of Talent Pat Patterson and Booking Assistant Terry Garvin resigned Monday amidst a scandal that could threaten the very future of the company. Patterson, who is generally considered one of the six or seven most influential men in the pro wrestling business, along with Garvin, one of his longtime assistants, announced their resignations following allegations of sexual misconduct by two former ring attendants, an ex front office employee, and charges made a few weeks back on the Wrestling Insiders radio show by former preliminary wrestler Barry Orton. The allegations of two former ring attendants, both of whom were underage at the time and one of which is planning to file a lawsuit within a few weeks, according to an article in this past Wednesday's New York Post were the first stories of this nature to actually make the mainstream news. WWF owner Vince McMahon was furious about the charges, particularly those made by Orton, because he felt that because of Patterson and Garvin's gay lifestyle, they would be unable to defend themselves against the charges even though both claimed they were innocent of any wrongdoing. McMahon said both felt by staying with the company it could have a severe negative impact on the company. Thus, according to McMahon, both men offer their resignations. McMahon on Tuesday denied all of the charges against both Patterson and Garvin. He said that Garvin totally refuted the charge made by Orton and McMahon was upset at Orton and those in the media for bringing up an incident from 1978. He was also upset with charges by a former employee in regard to Patterson as ridiculous and claimed the employee, Murray Hodgkins, who he called a certifiable lunatic, was fired because he couldn't do his job properly. He noted that Patterson has been in the wrestling business for 30 years and in that time hadn't had any allegations brought against him and claimed the various sources complaining both in regards to Patterson and Garvin and also Hulk Hogan weren't credible. McMahon did admit that Hogan didn't tell the complete truth on the Arsenio Hall show but denied he had anything to do with what Hogan said except he told Hogan to tell the truth. He said he was devastated when Hogan didn't tell the complete truth. McMahon was also critical of WCW Executive Vice President Kip Fry's new steroid policy and of the wrestling newsletter's reaction to the policy saying the only valid policy is involuntary testing if one is serious about the subject. He also denied knowing about any new letter sent to employees last week as was reported in last week's Observer even though one part-time employee claimed he received a letter last Monday with a release form to sign making himself available for steroid and drug tests that was mailed the previous Friday. McMahon was also defensive of his own steroid testing program, which he claimed was far better than that of either the International Olympic Committee or the National Football League. He released his written policy to the media shortly and, provided they dig themselves out of this current hole, he'll hold anabolic steroid symposiums with Dr. Mauro Di Pasquale, who is generally considered the leading expert on beating steroid tests in the Western world, of Canada to educate the media to the subject. In addition, McMahon, after many false starts, implemented steroid testing to his World Bodybuilding Federation performers with a blood test taken a few days back, The WWF wrestlers didn't have blood tests taken and the procedure for the bodybuilders will be more stringent than that of the wrestlers, and urine tests to be taken sometime this week. According to other sources in bodybuilding, McMahon told the bodybuilders they would be tested five times between now and the June 13th WBF championships in Long Beach and if the levels of steroids in the bodybuilder systems didn't continually decline in every test, then they would be suspended. McMahon said that he didn't think the current testing procedures used for the wrestlers were good enough, particularly when it came to the WBF competitors and said that everyone in the Long Beach contest will be off steroids in their final preparation phase. In a related development, the contract between McMahon's most highly publicized and highly paid bodybuilder, Lou Ferrigno, was severed on Friday. Ferrigno is claiming to still be with the WBF and simply taking time off to repair a hand injury which will result in him missing the WBF championships which were basically being promoted as a matchup between himself and last year's champion Gary Stridham. However, that isn't the case and sources close to the WBF said it was because Ferrigno balked at drug testing, a story McMahon didn't confirm. McMahon did say he expected Ferrigno to wind up with the rival leader organization. McMahon admitted losing Ferrigno was a major marketing blow to the fledgling WBF. Patterson, who came to work for the WWF in the late 1970s as a wrestler and upon his arrival, sold out Madison Square Garden four times in title matches against then-champion Bob Backlund, was considered one of the all-time great workers during his 24-year career. He was particularly well-known in Northern California where he was the area's leading drawing card in the early 1970s. His tag-team combination with Ray Stevens is one of the most famous duos in history, and perhaps with the exception of the Road Warriors, they were the only team to hold both the NWA and AWA World Tag Team titles during their career. Patterson was eventually moved into an office role after serving as a color commentator on television and becoming a part-time wrestler. After leaving the ring in 1985, 
He eventually took over as the second in command behind McMahon, as far as talent and booking in the WWF after the firing of George Scott. Garvin, who was also an active wrestler during the 60s and 70s, part of a famous wrestling family with brother Ron and brother Jimmy, neither of whom he was actually related to, eventually held off his positions with several promotions after retiring. He was working for Bob Geigel in Kansas City seven years ago when he made the move to the WWF. The resignations came just a few days into what will almost certainly be the most critical period ever for the WWF. There had been several allegations of steroid and other drug use, sexual harassment and sexual abuse that will be breaking in several newspapers around the country and on the ABC television show 2020 television over the next two weeks. Most of the major creative and talent decisions all along have been made by McMahon, who for all real purposes was the booker even though most in wrestling referred to Patterson as such. But Patterson was clearly his second in command for years and heavily involved in all creative angles. The loss of Patterson and Garvin will be a void and most likely J.J. Dillon will become in charge of the administrative end of the talent coordination. Rookie of the Year 1. Johnny B. Bad 2. Lightning Kid 3. Dishinriki 4. Dave Malenko 5. Chas Taylor Honorable Mention, Chris Candido, Rob Van Dam, J.T. Smith Previous Winners 1980, Barry Windham 1981, Brad Rangans and Brad Armstrong, tied. 1982, Steve Williams. 1983, Road Warriors. 1984, Tom Zank and Keiichi Yamada, tied. 1985, Jack Victory. 1986, Bam Bam Bigelow. 1987, Brian Pillman. 1988, Gary Albright. 1989, Dustin Rhodes. 1990, Steve Austin. Best play-by-play -play announcer. 1. Jim Ross. 2. Tony Schiavone. 3. Vince McMahon. 4. Dr. Alfonso Morales. 5. Akira Fukuzawa. Honorable mention, Craig Johnson. Previous winners. 1981, Gordon Soley. 1982, Gordon Soley. 1983, Gordon Soley. 1984, Lance Russell. 1985, Lance Russell. 1986, Lance Russell. 1987, Lance Russell. 1988, Jim Ross. 1989, Jim Ross. 1990, Jim Ross. Worst television announcer. 1. Gorilla Monsoon. 2. Herb Abrams. 3. Lord Alfred Hayes. 4. Vince McMahon. 5. Eric Bischoff. Honorable Mention, Sean Mooney, Craig Johnson, Jim Ross, Michael St. John, Dusty Rhodes, Roddy Piper. Previous Winners 1984, Angelo Mosca. 1985, Gorilla Monsoon. 1986, David Crockett. 1987, David Crockett. 1988, David Crockett. 1989, Ed Whalen. 1990, Herb Abrams. Best Major Wrestling Show. 1. WCW Wrestle War 91 February 24 Phoenix 2. New Japan slash WCW Starcade in Tokyo Dome 3. May 26 All Japan Women Tokyo 4. WCW November 18 Savannah Clash 5. WWF Royal Rumble January 16 Miami WCW Super Brawl May 19 St. Pete Honorable Mention April 18 All Japan Tokyo Budokan Hall WWF Summer Slam 91 August 27 New York WWF WrestleMania 7 March 26 Los Angeles New Japan G1 Tournament Final August 11 Tokyo All Japan Women WrestleMania Piad November 16 Kawasaki Previous Winners 1989 NWA Baltimore Bash July 23 1990 US and Japan Wrestling Summit April 13 Tokyo Worst Major Wrestling Show 1. WCW Baltimore Bash. 2. WWF Survivor Series. 3. WWF Summer Slam 91. 4. WWF WrestleMania 7. 5. WCW Fall Brawl Clash. Previous winners. 1989 WWF WrestleMania 5. 1990 WCW Clash 13. Best Wrestling Maneuver. 1. Masao Orihara's moonsault from top rope to the floor. 2. Jushin Liger's Frankensteiner off top rope. 3. Yoshihiro Asai's moonsault out of ring. 4. 
Scott Steiner's Frankensteiner. 5. Jushin Liger's Asai Moonsault. Honorable mention, Bull Nakano's Somersault Leg Drop Off Top Rope, Jushin Liger's Liger Flip Dive Out of the Ring, Cactus Jack's Elbow Drop to the Floor, Keiji Muto's Moonsault, Kenta Kobashi's Moonsault 1, Hiroshi Hazi's Northern Lights Suplex, Akira Hokuto's Northern Lights Bomb, Monkey Magic Wakita's Monkey Special. Previous winners 1981, Jimmy Snuka's Superfly Splash. 1982, Super Destroyer's Superplex, Scott Irwin. 1983, Jimmy Snuka's Superfly Splash. 1984, Davy Boy Smith's Power Clean Combination with Dynamite Kid's Dropkick Off the Top Rope. 1985, Tiger Mask to Die with Midair Flip Out of the Ring, Mitsu Haru Masawa. 1986, Chavo Guerrero's Moonsault Body Block Pin. 1987, Keiji Yamada's Shooting Star Press. 1988 Keiji Yamada's Shooting Star Press. 1989 Scott Steiner's Frankensteiner. 1990 Scott Steiner's Frankensteiner. Super Brawl 2. Thumbs up 89.5%. Thumbs down 01.0%. In the middle 09.5%. Best Match Poll. Jushin Liger vs. Brian Pillman. Rhodes and Wyndham vs. Austin and Zabishko. Rick Rude vs. Rick Steamboat. Worst match poll. Vegas and Morton vs. Sank in Hammer. Sting vs. Lex Luger. Terrence Taylor vs. Marcus Bagwell. Based on phone calls and fax messages to the observer as of Monday afternoon. It should be noted that because of a problem with the answering machine, all phone calls made from late Saturday night through 10 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday night failed to register on the tape. Anyone calling during that time period should phone once again before Monday morning for responses to be included as part of this poll. Margin of error, 100%. LPWA Super Ladies Showdown. Thumbs up, 82.3%. Thumbs down, 04.8%. In the middle, 12.9%. Best match poll. Harley Saito vs. Mizuki Endo. Harley Saito vs. Eagle Sawai. Worst match poll. Reggie Bennett vs. Denise Storm. Susan Green vs. Denise Storm. A few questions to ponder for the week before getting into the serious news. 1. Now that the natural disasters are baby faces, does that mean Typhoon becomes tugboat once again? 2. How come Lex Luger gained 20 pounds when he was getting ready to go from an organization with no steroid testing to an organization with the best steroid testing in the world? 3. With Luger history and WCW, who exactly is Mr. Hughes the bodyguard for? When I was in college, I had a professor who was considered one of the most influential people in the local city government. We were studying the makeup of city government and then one morning the headline story in the local newspaper was about probably the best known member of the city council being indicted for bribery from developers and assorted other misdeeds. Pretty much everyone in the class had either read or heard about it from that morning when we went into class and wondered how the professor would react to the news since the newspaper reported the charges in a manner where nobody really had any idea if they were true or not. The first thing he said, almost laughing, was, I guess you all learned this morning how city government really operates. I had that same feeling Wednesday when I heard about Phil Mushnick's column on the back page of the New York Post with the bold headline, WWF to face suit alleging child sex abuse. The story read as follows. The World Wrestling Federation, already reeling from allegations of persistent steroid abuse among its biggest kitty TV stars, appears headed toward even greater scandal. According to several highly placed sources, a lawsuit will be filed soon alleging that male WWF administrative employees and executives sexually harassed and abused underage teenage boys who were engaged as ring assistants in the mid and late 1980s. The suit, which is expected to be filed early next month at a New York federal courthouse, will also, according to the sources, charge the WWF with transporting minors across state lines for the purpose of oral corruption as well as violating child labor laws. The plaintiff's tales of sexual misconduct by WWF employees, according to the sources, have been corroborated by another party, who claims to have been similarly abused while an underage teen in the employ of the WWF as a ring boy or gopher. A WWF staffer, speaking yesterday from the organization's headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut, said the only authorized spokesman, Steve Planamenta, was unavailable for comment. David Dr. D. Schultz, a former WWF star, may have provided credibility to allegations of sexual abuse within the WWF when he was quoted last month about the organization in an independent pro wrestling magazine, Pro Wrestling Torch. We're talking about some of the top executives' sexual habits, their sexual preferences, sexual abuse and harassment. Schultz recently joined another ex-WWF superstar Billy Graham, 
in providing detailed claims of pervasive illegal drug use within the WWF, including steroid abuse by the WWF's marquee performer, Hulk Hogan. On Friday, Mushnick ran another item related to the story as part of his column. The World Wrestling Federation continues to take on water. This week's Village Voice reports that ex-WWF performer Barry Barry O'Orton recently appeared on a radio show over Kvague in Las Vegas, and said out loud what has been whispered about for years that WWF male executives engage in sexual harassment by a casting couch for male wrestlers. Orton provided details of one such episode in which he claims to have been repeatedly subjected to the advances of a WWF exec. Meanwhile, WWF performer Kerry Von Erich was arrested for drug possession, a lengthy WWF drug expose is expected in next week's Los Angeles Times, and a lawsuit alleging sexual abuse of underage boys by WWF staffers is expected to be filed in New York federal court early next month. Furthermore, ABC's 2020 has tentatively scheduled March 13th to air a piece that, in part, points to steroid abuse within the WWF. All this comes after allegations from ex-WWF star superstar Billy Graham and David Dr. D. Schultz that the WWF is lousy with illegal drugs and sexual exploitation, and that they personally watched or helped Kitty Hero Hulk Hogan inject steroids hundreds of times. And those allegations arose following a trial in which a Pennsylvania doctor, George Zahorian, was convicted of distributing steroids to several WWF stars, including Rowdy Roddy Piper. On Friday, the WWF responded with a press release aimed at Mushnick's stories. The New York Post has published a story containing serious, yet unsubstantiated charges about the World Wrestling Federation, WWF. We want to categorically state that the WWF and its parent company, Titan Sports, do not and will not tolerate illegal or improper behavior by any of our employees at any time. We will take responsible action regarding any legitimate claims filed through lawful channels. However, Titan Sports Incorporated and the WWF feel no obligation to respond to charges that cannot be reasonably substantiated. Further, our attorneys have advised us to urge all news media and others to consider the credibility and the motives of any accuser before irresponsibly making public reckless charges, which are not grounded in fact, and which may have been made with malicious intent. Titan Sports is proud to have corporate policies that are at the leading edge of any existing in the entertainment and sports industries regarding drug use, employment practices, and employee behavior. The lawyers in the lawsuit that Mushnick referred to in his column took depositions this past week from Barry Orton and superstar Billy Graham and are working on other depositions. I didn't expect this story to break at least until the lawsuit was filed. One reporter at ABC Television several weeks ago noted to me that many people in the New York media were aware of this impending story and were waiting to see who would break it first. In legal cases, we've also seen that two or three weeks in about to file a lawsuit time can stretch out a lot longer. When the lawsuit is filed, it becomes public record and anyone can read it and write about what is charged in graphic detail. What that means is anyone's guess. But we are about to enter three of the most interesting weeks in the history of this business. We've got the Los Angeles Times story on Hulk Hogan, which is expected to run within the next seven days, which will break the stories about Hogan that have both been in and some stories that have never been in these pages to the general public. We've got a four-part series in the San Diego Union Tribune, which will cover the same ground, but not only on Hogan, but on the entire wrestling industry. The 2020 piece, which is expected to be mild in comparison since the WWF is only a part of the steroid story, is only days away. The Washington Post has also started working on a piece. If that's all there is, then it'll be an embarrassing two weeks for the WWF leading into the biggest show of the year. If it mushrooms from there, it's impossible to predict just what will happen. The big question is, where does this leave the wrestling business and the WWF in particular? Pro wrestling is a unique form of sports entertainment and that will probably work in its favor. But the potential, because it's pro wrestling, is that if it doesn't work in its favor, it will devastate the WWF and maybe the entire wrestling business. Imagine if all of these stories broke at the same time about a team in the NFL, or even the NHL. From lies and hypocrisy on the steroid issue, allegations of an organization rampant with street drugs, alleged homosexual harassment of wrestlers tied into promotion and earning power, this aspect has the most potential to be blown, pardon that word, completely out of proportion since this is one allegation I'm not convinced of, to allegations of attempted homosexual abuse on underage boys. What would the result be? The media pressure, if attempts at a cover-up were blown, and general public reaction would be so intense that it would probably be one of the biggest sports scandals of the decade. It would make point shaving look like shoplifting. However, the league, whether it was the NFL or the NHL, would be ultimately spared by the press after it took its initial licks. The scapegoats would be the individuals caught and they'd be dead and buried. But not the industry.
in wrestling the odds are still better than 50 to 50 that no matter what happens, the mainstream media will ignore it because it's wrestling. In that case, there will be no devastating effects from all this other than possibly an embarrassing lawsuit and a few people losing their jobs or taking a publicity fall and scapegoats. But if the media jumps on this, and it's got enough sorted angles that it could easily mushroom from the Los Angeles and San Diego stories, then the WWF will be devastated. It won't be individuals, but the company and perhaps, sadly enough, even the entire industry that would take the heat. Even in a best-case scenario the WWF is finished as an important name in kids' products said New Jersey licensing consultant Woody Brown in an article by Irv Mushnick, in this week's Village Voice. That is a major chunk of income right there. Merchandising probably accounts for close to 50% of the company's revenue. If the media does seize the WWF as a cesspool of something or other and turns Vince McMahon into this year's Jim Backer, and the similarities in some cases are scary, particularly if there is any truth to some of these new allegations, then sponsors will sprint faster than Ben Johnson on steroids out of this industry. As written here before, the key is television. It will take one hell of a lot of impact and pressure from the media for television to cancel WWF programming. As we've pointed out here a few times, it has happened before in recent television history, the most obvious case being the Morton Downey Jr. television show, and all Mort did was work his own angle with himself by pretending skinheads beat him up in an airport bathroom when he apparently really smashed his own face into a sink to draw sympathy but when it came out it was a work, he was history. But it's very unlikely and certainly the worst case scenario, short of any criminal indictments. Without television the house shows and pay-per-views won't draw and the business on the level we know it will be a small piece of the history of television junk pop culture, just like the roller derby of the early 1970s. With television no matter how much bad ink this may get the house shows and pay-per-views will survive and probably won't be hurt that much, although if the Hogan name goes down in the process, the indirect effect on the WWF will be substantial. But the company will survive in its present form but maybe at a lower plateau. How will World Championship Wrestling fit into the picture in the rest of the wrestling industry? It's impossible to tell. In a worst-case scenario of WWF, it may adversely affect WCW merchandising as well. They won't take a direct hit in any of the scheduled pieces, but let's face it, while there is probably more steroid consumption in the WWF than in WCW, probably around 50% of WCW wrestlers are on the juice as well. If there is any impact on this business over the steroid issue, WCW may be treated nicer, but it won't be spared the criticism. And this criticism should hardly be limited to wrestling. When we're looking at this genre of entertainment aimed to generate merchandising, the new touring hit of the year, American Gladiators, probably has a great percentage of its athletes on steroids than either major wrestling group, and half the Gladiators are women. And remember, the WWF is pro-wrestling to the vast majority. If the WWF goes down, maybe some sponsors will jump on the WCW bandwagon but more than likely a few they'll notes jump on Gladiators, which, which won't scare the April negative wrestling the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis. The new issue of the WWF magazine that will be released this week lists the matches already announced on television, Hogan vs. Justice, Flair vs. Savage, Piper vs. Hart, plus The Undertaker vs. Jake Roberts match that will probably be announced next week. The magazine confirmed the original plan which was to have money incorporated, IRS and Ted DiBiase, defending the WWF tag team titles against Jim Duggan and Sergeant Slaughter, and the Legion of Doom in a street fight against the natural disasters. With the suspension of Hawk of Legion of Doom, they were pulled from the Mania show and the disasters were turned face and it'll now be IRS and DiBiase vs. Disasters for the tag team titles. The originally planned Shawn Michaels vs. Marty Jannetty match will now be Michaels vs. Tito Santana. Also scheduled is Tatanka vs. Rick Martel and Big Boss Man and British Bulldog and Virgil vs. Nasty Boys and the Mountie. The status of Legion of Doom in the WWF is currently still up in the air. McMahon had a meeting with Animal, who from most reports wants to stay with the company. Hawk has been wanting out for some time, but both men want to keep the tag team together. They haven't officially reached an agreement to return after WrestleMania, but the odds of it are much better this week than they were previously. While away this past weekend, we also caught the WCW show at the UIC Pavilion in Chicago on March 1st. The show was scheduled for eight matches, but it turned out to only have six and the entire undercard consisted of scrambled eggs. There were no announcements about a change in the lineup before the show, refunds offered and all that jazz that we write about every week. Brian Pillman vs. Johnny B. Bad was switched to Pillman vs. Mike Graham because of Bad's contract dispute. Richard Morton vs. PN News simply didn't take place because news wasn't there, although it isn't like anyone missed it. Abdullah the Butcher vs. Cactus Jack didn't take place since Abdullah has turned back with Cactus the night before, although both were in the building. 
Benny Vegas no-showed so Cactus replaced him teaming with Mr. Hughes against Ron Simmons and Big Joshua the top three matches went on as scheduled, although there was a lot of confusion regarding the main event, a cage match with Sting vs. Rick Rude. The match was never announced as a title match nor a non-title match in the building and on television it wasn't advertised either way. When Rude won most in the crowd believed the title had changed although there was no announcement made one way or the other, and went home with that feeling. This is very similar to WWF house shows now with Roddy Piper vs. Ric Flair cage matches that Piper is winning, and Piper even leaves with Arena holding both belts although no announcement is made. Anyway, the UIC show drew about 2,700 fans and $33,000. 1. Taylor pinned Bagwell in 1409 with a back suplex using the ropes for leverage. A little bit better than their match the previous night. 1 and 1 half star. 2. Pillman pinned Mike Graham in 949 with a cross-body block off the top rope. The local ref, Mike Figueroa, a commission ref, messed up the count to make the finish even worse. Pretty dull overall. After the match, Morton came out and challenged Pillman to a title match and Pillman agreed to give Morton the match on the spot. The bell rang, although there was no ref in the ring, they did one high spot and Morton walked out of the ring. Dud. 3. Simmons and Josh beat Cactus and Hughes in 219 when Simmons pinned Hughes with a power slam. Hughes landed wrong on the power slam and his back went out and he couldn't move so he just laid there and was pinned even though the ref stopped the count even though Hughes didn't kick out since it wasn't supposed to be the finish. It became obvious quickly to the crowd that Hughes was really hurt and the crowd reaction was interesting because almost everyone understood there was no acting involved and responded accordingly. When Hughes was taken out on a stretcher, the crowd clapped politely at him and even the little kids realized it was a legit injury. By Monday it appeared that Hughes wasn't hurt that badly and he may even be in the ring again this week. Dud. 4. Wyndham pins Abishko with an inside cradle in 659 in what was billed as a one fall death match. Finish got a lot of heat, and after the match, Wyndham flipped Medusa over. 2 and 1 quarter stars. 5. Steiners and Rhodes beat Anderson and Aiden and Austin in an elimination tag team match. Steiners did most of their offensive moves on all three for the first 10 minutes. Rhodes and Austin were both counted out at 1430. Scott Steiner backdropped Eaton over the top rope for the DQ in 20 hundred hours. This left Rick with Anderson and Eaton and Rick pinned Bobby at 21:31 with a bulldog off the top rope and Anderson with a clothesline as he was coming off the top rope in 21:48. Real good. Three and one half stars. Six. Rude pinned Sting in a cage match in 12:35. Sting came out first and gave a speech mocking Rude's speech about all the fat, of shaped sweat hogs. Action was pretty good throughout. Rude came off the top rope twice and if nothing else, since he fell off the cage a few weeks back shows he has a lot of guts. Finish saw Sting go after Paul E. Dangerously, who threw the phone into the ring and Rude used it on Sting and pinned him. Three and a quarter stars. This is the final issue of the current four-issue set. If you've got a one on your address label it means that your Observer subscription expires with this issue. Renewal rates remain $6 for four issues, $12 for eight, $24 for 16, $36 for 24, $48 for 32 up through $60 for 40 issues within the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Rates for any other foreign country is $9 for each set of 4 issues, $18 for 8 etc. up through $90 for 40 issues. All subscription renewals letters to the editor, reports of house shows, news items and any other correspondence related to this newsletter can be sent to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009122 Fax messages can be sent to the Observer at 408-378-6562 afternoon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, daily. EMLL Fuerza Guerrera captured the CMLL welterweight tournament on February 15 in Puebla beating El Khalifa, a local hero in Puebla, via submission in the finals. Khalifa had defeated America in the semifinals that night while Guerrera had defeated Felino. This sets up a title unification match with NWA welterweight champion Misterioso later in the year. Mascara de Sagrada, to nobody's surprise, captured the first CMLL World Super Mini, Midget Championship beating Espectrito Jr. in the finals on March 1 at Arena Mexico in Mexico City. In the semifinals on February 23 in the same building, Sagrada defeated Aguilita Solitaria in a face match while Espectrito Jr. beat Octagon Cheeto. Sagrada, generally considered the best midget worker of the past few decades, got a huge standing ovation and a pageantry-filled post-match celebration. February 21st at Arena Mexico in Mexico City saw Super Astro and Blue Demon Jr. and Alfilaso win two out of three falls from Tony Arce and Vulcano and Rocco Valente two stars, 
Apollo Dante's and Ultimate Dragon, Yoshihiro Asai, and Kato Kung Lee beat Javier Cruz in Bestia Salvaje and Blue Panther in 1942 when Dante's pinned Panther in the third fall with a Northern Lights suplex two and three quarter stars. Match was super when the workers Dante's Dragon Salvaje and Panther were in the ring but pretty bad when Lee was in, the new Infernales Parada Morgan and MS1 and El Satanico won two straight falls from the Untouchables, Jacques Mate and Massacre and Pierre Roth Jr., when Massacre was pinned by Morgan in the second fall to set up their hair versus hair match for February 28 that airs on television this coming Sunday four stars and Conan and Sangre Chicana went to a double disqualification with Pero Aguayo and CN Cars three stars. The story of the match was that Cars once again turned on Aguayo and Chicana and Cars both beat on a bloody Aguayo for three minutes before Conan made the save for Aguayo, his longtime enemy. Ray Bucanero, the younger brother of Parada Morgan, made his Mexico City debut on February 11th at Arena Coliseo. Octagon retained his Mexican middleweight title on February 12th in Acapulco going to a draw with Guerrera. On February 12th in Mexico City, Arce and Vulcano beat Canadian vampire Casanova, and Elio de Solitario with Casanova and Solitario not getting along. UWA. March 1st at El Torreo in now Calpan saw Enrique Vera beat El Muerte, Tar in Guatemala, in the main event of a hair versus mask match. La Muerte, who was managed by lead heel manager Andy Barrow, turned out to be Jose Sanchez Perez of Mexico. Vera bled buckets. In the co-feature, the Death Missionaries, El Signo and Black Power 2 and Negro Navarro, captured the UWA trio's title from Los Villanos, Gran Hamada and Viano 3 and El Colosso beat Rambo and Negro Casas, and The Killer, Silver King and El Texano and Fantasma beat the American Eagles, Tony Anthony and Danny Davis, and Dr. Wagner Jr. via DQ in the best match on the card. Scorpio and Scorpio Jr. and Canadian Tiger beat Katana and Alcon 78 and Celestial and Shu El Guerrero and Lobo Rubio and Ijo del Diablo beat Lasser and Kendo and Marlon. Hamada beat El Engendro in a hair versus hair match on February 29th in Cuernavaca. Silver King and Texano kept the UWA tag team titles beating Negro Casas and El Espanto Jr. on February 24th in Guanajuato. Main event on March 2nd in Puebla was American Eagles and Casas vs. Dos Caras, and Viano 3 and Colosso. February 28th in Netsawal Coyot with the main event having career vs. hair match with Tamba the Flying Elephant putting up his career and having to retire, if he lost against Canadian Tiger, Mike Lozanski s hair. All Japan. The biggest show of the week was February 27th in Matsumoto before a sellout 2600 for television taping of the show that aired Sunday night. The gimmick was a four-match series of singles matches with Jumbo Tsurita's team of himself, Akira Tao, Masafuchi and Yoshinari Ogawa against Mitsuharu Masawa's team of himself, Toshiaki Kawada, Kena Kobashi, and Tsuyoshi Kikuchi. Masawa's squad ended up winning the first three matches to clinch the deal although Tsurita captured the main event pinning Kobashi in 21-39 of a super match with his back suplex. Masawa made Tao submit to a face lock in 15-44, Kawada made Fuchi submit with a face lock in 14-24, I guess you can see why the face lock is so over in all Japan right now, and Kikuchi Pindogawa. Also on the card, Steve Williams and Terry Gordy beat Stan Hansen and Johnny Ace in 22-44 when Gordy pinned Ace, Dan Crawford and Doug Furness beat Dory Funk and Firecat, Brady Boone when Cat did the honors, Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura beat Haruka Aigen and Motoshi Okuma, State Patrol, Buddy Lee Parker and James Earl Wright, Upset Joe and Dean Malenko and Mighty Inoue and Masao Inoue and Asamu Tarenishi beat Satoru Osako and Mitsuo Momoda and Richard Slinger. Last Sunday's television show headlined by Williams and Gordy and Slinger vs. Surita and Tao and Ogawa drew a 4.7 video research and 5.3 Nielsen rating. All Japan announced its championship carnival singles tournament from March 21 to April 17 which will include all the top-named Japanese wrestlers plus Hanson, Gordy, Williams, Abdullah the Butcher, Ace, Crawford, Furness, Billy Black, Joel Deaton, the Master Blaster, Al Green, and the return of Dan Spivey. February 29th in Okazaki drew 2,900 as Misawa and Kawada and Kobashi beat Williams and Gordy and Slinger in 2202 when Kobashi pinned Slinger, Surita and Tao beat Hansen and Wright, Baba and Funk and Andre the Giant beat Fuchi and Okuma and Igen, Crawford and Furnace beat Parker and Ace, Malenko's beat Ogawa and Inoue and Kikuchi pinned Firecat. February 24th in Kuroki drew 1,200, smallest All Japan card in a long time, as Misawa and Kawada and Kobashi beat Surita and Tao and Ogawa in 2106, Williams and Gordy and Slinger beat Hansen and Ace and Parker, Crawford and Furnace beat Fire Cat and Wright, Baba and Funk and Kimura beat Okuma and Igen and Fuchi, Inoue pinned Dean Malenko and Joe Malenko pinned Prenishi. 
February 25th in Koga drew a sellout 1,900 as Misawa and Kawada and Kobashi beat Williams and Gordy and Slinger when Misawa pinned Slinger in 1910, Hansen and Ace beat Surita and Fuchi, Tao and Ogawa beat Furnace and Crawford, Baba and Kimura beat Akuma and Agon, Funk and Kikuchi beat State Patrol and Malenkos beat Inoue and Tarenashi. February 26th in Kisarao drew 1,800 as Surita and Tao and Fuchi beat Misawa and Kawada and Kikuchi when Tao pinned Kikuchi in 2537. Williams and Gordy and Slinger beat Wright and Ace and Hansen. Crawford and Furnace beat Funk and Ogawa. Kobashi pinned Parker. Malenkos beat Inoue and Tarenishi and Firecat pinned Osako. March 1st in Higashi drew a sellout 3,300 as Misawa and Kawada and Kikuchi upset Surita and Tao and Fuchi when Kikuchi pinned Fuchi in 2454. Hansen and Ace beat Furnace and Crawford when Hansen lariated Furnace. Andre and Inoue beat Gordy and Slinger when Andre pinned Slinger. Funk and Kobashi beat Firecat and Williams when Kobashi pinned Firecat. Baba and Kimura beat Okuma and Aigen. State Patrol beat Ogawa and Momoda. Joe Malenko beat Taranashi and Dean Malenko pinned Osako. The new tour opened on March 1st at the Yokohama Arena before a sellout 18,000 fans paying in excess of $1 million. Ringside was $156 for the New Japan 20th anniversary show. A lot of different things happened that drew the crowd including several old-timers matches and a tag team title change. Bam Bam Bigelow and Big Van Vader won the IWGP World Tag Team titles beating Hiroshi Hazi and Keiji Muto when Vader splashed Muto for the pin in 24-18. The main event saw Ricky Chashu and Kengo Kimura beat Antonio Inoki and Osamu Kido in 28-00 when Chashu pinned Kido with a lariat. Kimura got a rare main event as a sub for Masa Saito, who was hospitalized, while Kido got a main event which was announced well in advance as a sub for Tatsumi Fujinami, who was in Milwaukee for Super Brawl. In other matches on the special card, Samurai Osamu Matsuda returned from Mexico and pinned Tiger Mask, Koji Kanemoto, in a super match. Kanemoto under the hood did a complete Satoru Sayama replica routine which got over huge to the longtime fans who remembered Sayama who was one of the country's biggest drawing cards as the original Tiger Mask, 1981-83. Also retired wrestlers Seiji Sakaguchi and Shozo Kobayashi won via disqualification from Tiger Jeet Singh and Umanosuke Ueda, the top heel tag team in New Japan up, until the mid-1980s, Kantaro Hoshino and Kotetsu Yamamoto, the television color commentator, went to a 10 o'clock draw with Black Cat and Hiroyoshi Yamamoto, Shinya Hashimoto pinned Masachono in 1810 of a super match, Shiro Koshinaka pinned Akira Nagami, Brian Blair beat Mishiyoshi Ohara in his final match in Japan before he leaves for Europe for seasoning for a few years, and Osamu Nishimura pinned Satoshi Kojima. Upcoming big shows have on March 2nd, Bigelow and Vader vs. Chashu and Chono and Hazi vs. Singh and a television taping on March 9th as Bigelow and Vader defending the IWGP tag team titles against Chono and Hashimoto, Jushin Liger defending the IWGP junior heavyweight title against Mad Bull Buster Spike, Chashu and Takayuki Izuka and Samurai vs. the returning blonde outlaws in Koshinaka and Kunyaki Kobayashi vs. karate fighters Akatoshi Saito and Masashi Aoyagi. March 11th at Tokyo's Karakuen Hall has Bigelow and Vader vs. Masa Saito and Hazi Nagami vs. a blonde outlaw to be announced, Samurai against another blonde outlaw Hashimoto and Izuka vs. two other blonde outlaws and Chashu and Chono and Muto vs. Vader and the Wild Samoans, Kokina and Samu. For those of you planning trips to Japan, here are the major New Japan shows through January. April 30th at Sumo Hall will be the finals of the Junior Heavyweight Tournament, May 17th is a big show at Osaka's Castle Hall, 13,000 seats, June 26th is Tokyo Budokan Hall, which may be the one-night tournament for the NWA title, August 7th, 10th, 11th, 12th is the second annual G1 tournament with opening night in Nagoya, and the next three nights at Sumo Hall. September 23rd will be the return to Yokohama Arena, November 22nd and November 23rd are two more straight nights in Sumo Hall, December 11th is Nagoya Rainbow Hall and December 14th is a major show in Osaka while Starcade 93 will be January 4th at the Tokyo Dome and tickets go on sale on October 10th. February 22nd television headlined by Muto and Hazi vs. Scott Norton and Brad Armstrong drew a 7.7 video research rating and a 6.2 Nielsen rating. Other Japan Notes the UWFI drew a sellout 2,600 to Tokyo's Karakuen Hall on February 29th as Gary Albright pinned Masato Kakihara in 228 in the main event to help build up the Albright vs. Nobuiko Takata match which most figure will headline the March 17th card in Nagoya. Takata beat Mark Fleming, protege of Luthez has met with an arm lock, Kazuo Yamazaki beat Tom Burton, Yoji Angio beat Yuki Miyato, Kiyoshi Tamura beat Mark Silver and Tatsuo Nakano beat Pez Watley. 
All Japan women on February 29th in Kamagaya drew 1,750 as Minami Toyota and Suzuka Minami and Seike Hasegawa won two out of three falls from Asia Kong and Miyori Kamiya and Koro Ito, Tashio Yamada pinned Debbie Malenko, Bull Nakano pinned Atsuko Mita and Kyoko Inoue and Yumuko Hata beat Akira Hokuto and Tomoko Watanabe. Wing starts its new tour on March 6th with a headline match on tour being Ivan Koloff versus Mr. Pogo in a Russian chain match on March 11th. Also on tour are Miguelito Perez, Iceman Ricky Santana, Vic Steamboat, Vladimir Koloff, Rip Rogers, and the Headhunters. Onita announced an outdoor show at the Kawasaki Baseball Stadium, where he drew a sellout 33,000 fans last year, for June 17th. The Masakatsu Fanaki vs. Roberto Duran match will be announced at a press conference in Miami, on March 19th. PWF on February 24th at Karakuen Hall drew a sellout 2,300 as Funaki made Wayne Shamrock submit in 40.00, Minoru Suzuki made Jerry Flynn submit in 8.46, Yoshiaki Fujiwara beat Yusuke Fukfai the 5 knockdown rule in 15.58, Bart Vale beat Kazuo Takahashi and El Kilauea beat Wellington Wilkins Jr. Japanese Television Rundown February 22nd New Japan 1. Liger pinned Pegasus Kid to retain both the IWGP Jr. and WCW light heavyweight titles in 1622 with a rolling crotch hold. Liger was selling his rib injury so Pegasus had to carry the match and looked great in doing so. Liger did the Asai moonsault and kicked out of several moves off the top rope. 3 and 3 quarter stars. 2. Kimura and Chashu and Saito beat Nagami and Chono and Hashimoto in 1326 when Kimura pinned Nagami with a power bomb after Chashu hit Nagami with a lariat. All action good match. 3 and 1 half stars. 3. Koshinaka and Kunyaki Kobayashi beat Akatoshi Saito and Tashi, two karate fighters from Nagoya where this card was being taped. This mixed match only went 456 but was intense with a ton of heat. The crowd was on its feet the whole way and it pretty well was worked to look like a shoot. The karate guys from the stable that Saito and Tashi came from were at ringside along with the New Japan prelim wrestlers, and at one point both sides started fighting. Koshinaka made Tashi submit with a dragon sleeper. Two and three quarter stars. Four. Muto and Hazi kept the IWGP World Tag Titles beating Norton and Brad Armstrong in 2237. Hazi and Brad were great here. Brad sold a lot of the match and was finally penned by Muto's moonsault. Four stars. February 23rd All Japan. 1. Kawada and Kikuchi beat Crawford and Furnace in 1412 of a super match. Kawada made Crawford submit with the Dragon Sleeper in the finals. All sorts of great spots and near falls. A legit match of the year candidate. Four and a half stars. 2. Ace and Hansen beat Masawa and Kobashi when Hansen hit Kobashi with a lariat and Ace pinned him. After the match Hansen hit Masawa with two more lariats. Three and three quarter stars. 3. Williams and Gordy and Slinger beat Surida and Tao and Ogawa when Williams pinned Tao with the Oklahoma Stampede. Okay match but nowhere close to the level of the previous two matches. Slinger is really good but very small. Two and a half stars. USWA. February 25th in Louisville saw Kenny Kendall pin Doug Masters, Coco were pinned Jim Steele, Pat Tanaka pinned Tony Falk, Brian Christopher beat Tom Pritchard via DQ, Dirty White Girl beat Connie, Connie Cook, subbing for CJ, more on that later, in a mud match, Eric Embry beat Tony Anthony in a scaffold match, Jerry Lawler beat Black Dog via countout for throwing fire and Jeff Jarrett and Junkyard Dog beat Moondogs via DQ. CJ Embry's valet left the tour last week and claimed sexual harassment on the part of Eric Embry and no word how this will all be settled. A new tag team debuted called the Fat Boys, Meat, and Potatoes. They were pretty green and will apparently feud with the Moondogs. A lady came out and took a seat at ringside and scouted this team and all the matches during the television show on Saturday. King Cobra returned and will challenge Brian Christopher for the Texas title. Embry got a swollen shut eye from a potato shot on Monday night from Tanaka to start a new feud. Embry KO'd Dirty White Girl after the match and she was carried out of the ring. On television Tanaka beat Falk and after the match White Girl attacked Miss Jennifer. The March 2nd card at the Mid-South Coliseum saw the Fat Boys vs. Falk and Jim Steele, Dirty White Girl vs. Miss Texas for the USWA Ladies title, Christopher vs. Cobra for the Texas title, Pritchard vs. Dr. Death, no idea who, managed by Nurse Cratchit, for the Southern title, Tanaka vs. Embry for the Bare Knuckles title held by Tanaka, Moore vs. Kimala for the USWA title and Moondogs vs. Lawler and Jarrett for the USWA tag team titles. Dr. Death uses a proctologist glove as a gimmick while his nurse uses a bedpan to KO the foes as a gimmick. Global. With the number of comps heavily reduced, 
The crowd on February 28 at the Dallas Sportatorium was down to 500. For March 23rd on ESPN, Barry Horowitz pinned Ben Jordan when Bruce Pritchard held his feet so Horowitz retained his GWF light heavyweight title, Bull Payne and Black Bart beat Bill Irwin and Rattlesnake in a double bull rope match when Irwin was tied to the ropes and they double teamed and pinned Rattlesnake and John Tatum and Rod Price beat Gary Young and Scott Putski to keep the GWF tag team titles when behind the ref's back. Price hit Putski with one of the belts for the pin. For March 25th on ESPN, Dark Patriot, Doug Gilbert, beat Terry Garvin via count out and Black Bart won a 10-man taped fist battle royal to become the first GWF Brass Knucks champion. The final two were Bart and Irwin and Bart used the branding iron to get the title. For March 30th on ESPN, Dark Patriot and Big Bad John beat Brian Farrar and Mike Reed in a terrible match. Payne drew Irwin in a good match, Jordan beat Horowitz via DQ and Bart pinned Young using the branding iron. In the dark match main event, Eddie Gilbert and Garvin beat Dark Patriot and Big Bad John, Eddie pinned brother Doug after hitting him with a chain and after the match Eddie was attacked and bled buckets and Eddie did a stretcher job. They are doing dark matches and an attempt to perk up the house show attendance since previously all the matches eventually aired on television, and also to use juice since it's banned by ESPN. March 6 that the Sportatorium has fantasy, Billy Joe Travis and Stephen Dane as a heel team, versus Chaz and Tug Taylor, Horowitz versus Garvin in a no-DQ match, Payne vs. Irwin with Samantha at ringside to be countered by Big Bertha, Bill Irwin in drag, Bart vs. Sam Houston for the Brass Knucks title, Dark Patriot vs. Patriot for the North American title with Gilbert, as Ref and Pritchard in a cage and Gilbert vs. Big Bad John in a non-televised barbed wire match. Jeff Gaylord showed up Friday night looking for a job and apparently asked Gilbert why he hadn't hired him. Gilbert said because he didn't even know Gaylord was looking for a job and apparently told him that he had the next four weeks booked so he couldn't use him until then. Gaylord claimed that he had told Skander Akbar weeks ago that he was looking for work and Gilbert said he hadn't heard about it. Apparently this didn't go as diplomatic as it sounds because Gaylord sucker punched Gilbert and was pounding on him until brother Doug hit Gaylord in the head with a coke bottle and Gaylord left the building bleeding all over while Eddie had a puffed out face from the punches that landed. Joe Petticino apparently decided that Gaylord will never work for GWF in the future. Here and there. Blackjack Mulligan beat Mondo Clean to become the champion for Eddie Mansfield's IWF on February 28 in Orlando before 200 fans at the fairgrounds. Clean is now gone from the promotion. GWF is interested in Clean. February 29 in Caguas, Puerto Rico saw Cyclone Salvadorino beat Randy Rhodes, The Wild One beat Herb Gonzalez, Rockin' Rebel, from Pennsylvania, beat Aki Malumba Louisiana lay bet Fidel Sierra via DQ, Invader No. 1 beat Ron Garvin via DQ, Miguelito Perez pinned Dick Slater, Carlitos Colon DDQ Dick Murdoch and the Heartbreakers beat Rex King and Ricky Santana. February 28th in Yabaco, Puerto Rico saw Wild One and Rhodes beat Rebel and El Corsario Louisiana Le beat Mulumba via DQ, Slater pinned Perez, Colon for Ron Garvin, Salvadorino beat Sierra via DQ, Murdoch pinned Invader No. 1 and the Heartbreakers beat King and Santana. February 29th in Portland saw Bart Sawyer beat Ron Harris via DQ, John Rambo beat C.W. Bergstrom, Mike Winner beat Al Madrill via DQ and Mike Miller interfered. Steve Dahl beat Don Harris in an I Quit match and Brickhouse Brown and Sawyer and the Grappler beat Colonel De Beers and Buddy Rose and Miller via DQ on a reverse decision. The Fox Network television show Over the Edge is doing a special about a guy training at the Monster Factory preparing to make his wrestling debut. The wrestler's name is Ronald Oaks from Washington and he'll debut this coming weekend on Sharp's shows March 6th in Union, New Jersey and March 7th in Woodbury, New Jersey and the show will air in April. Speaking of Sharp, He'll be holding Monster Factory tryouts at the Tampa Sportatorium on April 5th which will include a tape delay showing of WrestleMania and buffet and drinks for the media. LPWA is pretty well done in the United States with no future cards or tapings planned but will still attempt to syndicate the old tapes in Canada. February 29th in Kaufman, Texas for a Chris Love show drew 388 kids were free, which included Bull Payne, Awesome Kong, Jeff Gaylord, Billy Travis, Terry Daniels, Stephen Dane and the main event had Steve Simpson beat Rod Price. Kevin Von Erich is running a show on March 7th in Denton, Texas with himself defending the WCCW title against the Arabian Sultan, Tony George managed by Skander Akbar, and Chris Adams vs. Iceman King Parsons. West Coast Championship Wrestling drew 200 fans on February 14th in Chilliwack, BC with Buddy Wayne beating Michelle Starr in a coal miner's glove match on top. Tim Flowers and Ole Olsen also worked the show. Upcoming shows March 12th in Surrey, BC and March 27th in Aldergrove, BC. South Atlantic Pro Wrestling drew 90 on February 14th in Mars Hills, North Carolina with Bambi beating Peggy Lee Leather 2 stars, Helmut Hessler beat Patriot Del Wilkes, 2 stars and Patriot won a battle royal. 
the name of the San Antonio-based prelim wrestler killed in a bar altercation a few weeks back was Curtis Poe, not Curtis Toe as reported here. Congrats to Jeff Zinger on his recent marriage. Tony Candela's WFWA drew 275 fans on February 25 in Winnipeg with sudden impact, Chris Jericho and Lance Storm, wrestlers named Pampero El Firpo and Red Bastian Jr., no relation to either, and another wrestler named Gene Kiniski. A real big-time wrestler Nick Bockwinkle did the color while the biggest names appearing were Bulldog Bob Brown and Jerry Morrow. Howard Brody's Ladies Major League Wrestling drew 716 paid on February 28 in Imokalee, Florida as A.J. Watson beat Big Bad Mama, Peggy Lee Leather beat Allison Royal, Luna Vashon beat Malia Hasaka, Bambi Double Countout with Pink Cadillac managed by Sir Oliver Humperdinck, Wendy Richter beat Penelope Paradise by a DQ and Cadillac won a 10-woman battle royal. Iqua drew 220 on February 27 in Tampa as Hercules Hernandez beat Greg Valentine by a DQ, Jim Becklin beat Coconut Man via DQ to keep the light heavyweight title, Hurricane Walker beat Tex Salinger via DQ when Dan Spivey interfered, Spivey pinned Tommy Starr and Bambi pinned Peggy Lee Leather. Jim Neidhart debuts with this group next week and Denny Brown returns. February 25th in Philadelphia at the Original Sports Bar saw J.T. Smith and D.C. Drake DDQ Larry Winters and Johnny Hotbody. Ivan Koloff did a job for Tony Stetson. Promoter Todd Gordon announced Kevin Sullivan, Eddie Gilbert, One Man Gang and Neidhart is coming in for future cards. Gator B. Long has a show on April 25th in Naples, Florida headlined by Bugsy McGraw and Lord Humongous and manager Abdullah Farouk Jr. Wrestler cowboy Woody Lee, Woody Coulter, had his home burned down on February 28th in Lima, Ohio as a result of an electrical fire. None of his family was home at the time although his dog perished. Lee lost everything he owns in Motor City Wrestling at 313-795-9490 would like any indies in the Ohio and Michigan area to contact them as he's looking for any bookings he can get. WCW. Johnny B. Bad is in the midst of a contract dispute with management. Several different versions have come our way, but apparently Bad and Kip Fry agreed to a contract for $156,000 per year but it wasn't signed. Bad has claimed he wanted better injury benefits, the contract calls for a specific time period if the wrestler is out of action with an injury that the contracts don't cover him, while others say he asked for more money. Bad has negotiated with Titan. Bad did have a meeting on Monday with Fry to work things out, but he was pulled from the pay-per-view show because of the dispute. February 25th in Macon, Georgia drew 2000 as Tom Zank beat Diamond Dallas Page, Terrence Taylor pinned Van Hammer, Mr. Hughes beat Big Josh, Steiners beat Young Pistols, pretty good, Jushin Liger pinned Richard Morton Liger's worst match of the tour which he was well aware of, and was throwing things in the locker room because so many moves and the finish were missed. Barry Windham pinned Larry Zabishko and in a cage match, Sting and Ricky Steamboat and Dustin Rhodes and Ron Simmons beat Rick Rudin and Bobby Eaton and Arnold Anderson and Steve Austin. The next clash will be mid-June in Charleston, South Carolina. World Championship Wrestling drew a 2.7 rating last week while main event did a 2.6 and power hour a 1.9. Jesse Ventura's first worldwide wrestling taping will be March 20th in Topeka. WWF Heading into the WWF full-time on the road are Brian Adams as Crush and Del Wilkes. The television production in last weekend's Jake Roberts slash Randy Savage slash Elizabeth slash Undertaker angle was incredible when you consider the scene in front of the curtain took place one day, and the scene behind the curtain took place the next day. Even though there is an explosion brewing behind the scenes, few people are aware of it and business has been excellent the past few weeks leading to WrestleMania. February 29th in Boston drew 10,000 fans and $150,000 as Warlord pinned Chris Walker, Rick Martell drew British Bulldog, Tito Santana pinned Ted DiBiase, Natural Disasters beat Jim Duggan and Sergeant Slaughter via DQ, JW Storm pinned Cato, Big Boss Man pinned Repo Man and Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper beat Ric Flair and Sid Justice when Hogan pinned Flair. February 24th in Hershey, Pennsylvania saw Tatanka pin Cato, Shawn Michaels pinned Jim Powers, IRS pinned Virgil, Owen Hart pinned Bo Beverly, Santana pinned DiBiase, Natural Disasters beat Duggan and Slaughter via DQ, Bret Hart beat Mountie and Randy Savage pinned Jake Roberts in a cage match. Former WWF wrestler Paul Roma, who appeared on the Wrestling Insiders this past Saturday night, makes his pro boxing debut this coming Friday. Roma said his weight has dropped from 250 in wrestling to 215 for boxing, 15 pounds of which he attributes to getting off steroids. He said he had no problems with drawing from steroids even though others have and that he felt steroids were a necessary evil when working in the WWF.
Roma said that in order to get a release from Titan Sports to keep his glory nickname that he had to sign a deal that said he would give Titan Sports no negative publicity, although he termed his stay there six years of hell. March 2 in Johnstown, Pennsylvania drew 3,600 as British Bulldog pinned Martel 1 and 1 half star, Cato pinned Storm 1 half star, Bossman pinned Repo Man 1 and 1 half star, Disasters beat Duggan and Slaughter via DQ 1 slash 4 1 star, Warlord pinned Walker Dud, Santana pinned DiBiase 2 stars and Piper beat Flair in a cage match 2 stars. February 28 in Pittsburgh drew 12,500 as Warlord pinned Walker, Bossman pinned Repo Man, Santana pinned DiBiase, Disasters beat Duggan and Slaughter by DQ. Storm pin Cato, Bulldog pin Martel, Hogan and Piper beat Flair and Justice when Hogan pinned Flair. February 29th in Springfield, Ma drew 4,500 as Storm pin Cato 3 slash 4 1 star, Martel pin Bossman 2 and 1 quarter stars, Santana pin DBSE 1 and 3 quarter stars, Bulldog pin Repo Man 1 slash 4 1 star. Disasters beat Duggan and Slaughter by DQ 1 star and Piper beat Flair in a cage match 3 stars. These cage matches have the finish where first both guys hit the ground simultaneously. And they go back in the ring and one of the heels smashes the door on Piper's head but he recovers and gets down to the floor first. February 21st in Worcester saw Martel beat Rex Armstrong, Skinner pinned Jim Brunzel, Berserker pinned Hercules, Bushwhackers beat Nasty Boys, Bossman beat Repo Man via DQ, Undertaker pinned Bulldog and Piper beat Flair in a cage match. Demolition Axe, Bill Eadie filed a suit against the WWF and McMahon for a share of profits because he claimed he came up with the demolition persona. Among those Edie's lawyer got depositions from were Earthquake, Big Boss Man, Jesse Ventura, Jake Roberts, Jim Duggan, Randy Savage, Typhoon, Cato and I. S. The New York Times ran a piece on Tuesday morning when the mayor of Stanford, Connecticut proposed a show to raise money for the public library at the local high school stadium. The WWF would provide the wrestlers at no charge for the show. But when residents of those who live near the stadium heard about the plan, they protested at a city council meeting last week and seemed to have gotten the idea next. The show has been postponed until a new time and a new venue can be determined. Expect the WWF to hire a high-powered PR firm to try and present a positive image in the wake of what will be coming out in the next two weeks. The Reader's Pages Rob Fudd of 625 Wrexham Avenue, Columbus, Ohio 43223 is looking for tapes of the Crockett Cup Tag Team Tournaments. Benny Riccardi of 33 Utica Road, Edison, New Jersey 08820 is looking for tapes of Joel Goodhart shows and of Florida shows from the 1980s. Chris Body of 613 University Avenue No. 006, Syracuse, New York 13210 is looking for tapes of TBS and worldwide wrestling shows from 1985 to 87 and world class from 1985 to 86. Harvey Cobb of 2619 Ruffin Way, Norfolk, Virginia 23504 has wrestling tapes to trade. Andy Weinberg of Box 237 Narrows Run Road, Crapolis, Pennsylvania 15108 is looking for the TNT episode with Randy Savage and Elizabeth, A.D. Kid and Iron Sheik and also for a tape of the October 25th Hogan vs. Flair match from Oakland. Joseph Carroll 2 of 7330 Rutterau Avenue, Pensacola, New Jersey 08109 has a list of concert and wrestling tapes for trade and is selling issues of the Wrestling Observer from July-February 90 to the present. Don Hernandez of 345 N Melrose Dr. Hashtag E, Vista California 92083 is looking for any referee jobs and will go anywhere in the country on the shortest of notice. You can call him at 619-945-3094. He has nine years experience as a wrestler and was trained by the Hearts in Canada. Ashul Maldonado of 40 to 15 61st ST Hashtag 2B Woodside New York 11377 is looking for old WWWF, AWA and UWF tapes and will trade anything in his collection in exchange for them. He also gets EMLL tapes for anyone who is interested in trading for them. Bobby Yates of 1971 D Lakeview Road, Ashboro, North Carolina 27203 is looking for the Japanese wrestlers telephone cards. Lena Sargent of 12 Spring Street, Gainesville, Georgia 30501 is looking for a weekly supplier of USW at tapes from Memphis and can trade tapes from almost everywhere else in exchange. He's also looking for a tape of Jim Kernett's birthday party for his dog Fifi, the FMW Tag Team Tournament, and Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous episodes on Jesse Ventura and Jason Hervey and any other television shows involving wrestlers or wrestling. Craig Reedy is publishing a newsletter called Wrestling Down Under at P.O. Box 988, Bayswater, Victoria 3153 Australia for $2 US per issue and $2.50 Australian currency. Robert Costello of 966 Hungerford Drive Hashtag 28B, 
Rockville, Maryland 20850 would like to hear from readers in Maryland, Virginia, D.C., area that are interested in attending live shows. Slammers Wrestling Gym at P.O. Box 1602, Studio City, California 91614 is selling Slammers Wrestling Federation tournament tapes for $35 plus $5 postage and handling. LPWA Pay-Per-View Show Since the time women's wrestling was legalized in California in the late 60s, I've hated it. I didn't respect the women as wrestlers or athletes and regarded women's wrestling as some sort of a sexual freak show. The best thing I ever said about a women's match was that it was short. So you can see I was prejudiced. The jumping bomb angels in the WWF challenged my point of view and later I became interested in Mary the Duchess of Discipline, bad girl in LPWA, who stole a couple of Alex Knight independent shows in Los Angeles. After meeting Magnificent Mimi at the Cauliflower Alley dinner and watching some Japanese tapes, I developed a small interest. I ordered the LPWA pay-per-view show due to the write-up in The Observer and to my surprise, I enjoyed it as much or more than any pay-per-view show ever. I gave the show a huge thumbs up and would rate it as 4 stars. All the matches were great with nothing less than 2 and 3 quarter stars. Great work, good heat, the Japanese girls, particularly Harley Saito lived up to their reputation and the Americans, Terry Power, Reggie Bennett, Denise Storm and Black Venus, seemed to be improving. The interviews were all realistic and believable and not just boring shouting into the mic. Denise Storm impressed me as a great subtle heel and the announcers were great. But the main reason I enjoyed it more than any pay-per-view in memory was that at no point did they insult your intelligence. The newsletters should do a better job in promoting women's wrestling and the LPWA. The Americans are improving and need a place to work regularly. It's a shame that the two best women wrestlers in the U.S. are in their prime now and working as managers. Steve Yohei. Alhambra, California. Mucknick Column. One would think Vince McMahon is now at wit's end. I mean, he's still reeling from the steroid scandal that hasn't gone away and now he gets pulverized with a sex scandal. When you think about it, the scenario described is pretty sick. If it's true, then those involved should be called on the carpet and be held accountable for their actions. I hope McMahon has the brains not to lie and cover this up as was done in the steroid fiasco. Joe Dante. Union, New Jersey. I got a chance to hear you on Wrestling Insiders this weekend and I must say you are one of the best sports analysts I've heard in any sport. You have a great head for seeing the big picture and articulating your observations which is uncommonly refreshing in the world of wrestling. It seems like we may be in the most important phase of wrestling history since 1984. Only in this case, the steroids, hard drugs and homosexual harassment stories may be completely devastating. Have you talked with, name withheld by editor, about this issue? Apparently when he went for a tryout with the WWF he ran into the same experiences that Barrio was talking about. Maybe you should interview him privately and see if his stories match up with anyone else's. While I have certain spiritual opinions about homosexuality in general, I'm not inclined to try to force my opinions on anyone else, especially in the wrestling world. But sexual harassment in any form is unfair and in certain cases, illegal. Whatever consenting adults do is one thing, but exchanging her promotion and contracts for sexual favors is quite another. David Hart, San Diego, California. Overseas. This is a letter for all the U.S. wrestlers that read The Observer. Please do not do business with a promoter in South Africa named Mr. Shane aka Shane J. Paul. He is an Indian promoter that will leave you stranded without pay or in jail without any money. He will cancel your ticket home once you get there. Myself and Ron Starr were left out to dry and without any money, food, or shelter plus no tickets home. Don't do business with him. Bobby Blaze. Largo, Florida. Goodhart. On Saturday, January 18th, Joel Goodhart ceased all of his ties to the wrestling business. Being from the Philadelphia area I know the disappointment this has left to the hardcore wrestling fans of the area. I think nobody can duplicate Goodhart's contributions to the sport of pro wrestling in this area with his radio show luncheons, trips to major events, fan clubs and the best cards for real fans. Bill Garrett. Abington, Pennsylvania. In response to your article on Joel Goodhart, I'm responding with my own letter. I was one of the season ticket holders left empty-handed when he went out of business. I found out from a friend who called me up that he closed up shop with no notice and no warning. I had tried to contact him several times and left several messages during the early part of January when I hadn't received my tickets to the January 25th show and he never even had the courtesy to respond to my messages. The way he dealt with his customers was a disgrace. He owes all his former customers an accounting of where the money went and an apology. Since Goodhart didn't have the decency to contact his customers and handled the whole matter in an unethical manner, 
I failed complaints with the Better Business Bureau in Philadelphia and the Consumer Division of the Attorney General's Office in Philadelphia. I have also provided the U.S. Post Office in Philadelphia with information to see if it would be appropriate for them to launch an investigation relating to mail fraud since a product was sold through the mail and not delivered. I urge all others who have been gypped by him to do likewise by getting the number by calling Philadelphia information. I might be out $140 and maybe the complaints I filed won't accomplish much other than to make me feel better, but if they force Goodhart to step forward and be honest with his former customers and the wrestling public, I'll be satisfied. I applaud Goodhart's efforts in bringing top-name wrestling stars and great wrestling action to the Northeast as well as giving fans what they want to see. However, I can't condone his lack of honesty and the sneaky and underhanded way he dealt with his customers. Deborah McWilliams Jersey City, New Jersey WCW. Kip Fry's initial moves have garnered virtually unanimous approval thus far. Most of the moves, however, are correct past stupidity or addressing neglected crises that marred the reign of Jim Hurt. What is most important is how he, WCW and the Turner organization as a whole will respond to the issues raised by the EEOC's investigation of racial discrimination in WCW. This will show how Fry will respond to the thornier challenges that face him. Although I don't know the specifics of the particular EEOC case filed, the harsh real facts are that pro wrestling has not in the main really broken the color barrier. Just look at the few black wrestlers featured in the big groups the bodyguard Virgil, the bodyguard Mr. Hughes, the all-American Ron Simmons, Abdullah the Butcher and now Papa Shango. In 1962, Ebony Magazine did a feature on the top black wrestlers of the day including Bearcat Wright, Sailor Art Thomas, Bobo Brazil, and Dory Dixon. Could you imagine a magazine such as that doing a piece like that today? True, the answer doesn't lie in simply bringing back JYD, or handing a world title belt to Ron Simmons to justify your case. There must be a plan to recruit, train, and develop quality black athletes for pro wrestling. While today's problem is partly a result of the short-sighted destruction of the territories that worked as a feeder system, it particularly manifests itself in the dearth of top black wrestlers. If Fry and WCW try to dodge this bullet by bringing in a few old-time black wrestlers as tokens, they are only shooting themselves in the foot. A bold new approach is needed, not that much different from the route taken by Branch Rickey. You also need black bookers who hopefully would be less likely to rehash stale 1960s stereotypes. It shouldn't be hard to figure out that this could result in not only more black fans attending house shows and buying pay-per-views, but also adding the exciting elements of black culture that have enlivened and reinvigorated every other start and area of entertainment. The fact that there still hasn't been a black world champion is just an example of this disgrace. If WCW is serious about overtaking WWF, then they should beat them to the punch on this issue fast. Eddie Goldman New York, New York I don't know if Sting is the right man on top for WCW. I agree he's the most over face in the promotion and the short-term thinking always says to put the most over guy on top and hope it'll sell tickets. There is also a symbolic importance in having Sting pin Luger if Luger winds up in the WWF as Hogan's successor. The problem is Sting needs opponents who can sell tickets against him and WCW is very thin on lead heels. After Rude there is nobody. While Austin has promise, he's not ready and the matchup won't draw. In theory they always can, and probably will, turn Wyndham but they run the risk of turning him into another Luger that nobody cared about. Eaton, Taylor and Anderson all have the ability, but due to the way the promotion has used all of them, they can't get over as main event draws. On the other hand, the promotion is rich with faces they could put on top against a heel champion with Steamboat, Simmons, Wyndham, Rick and Scott Steiner and Pillman. At least one person in the company would put Dustin Rhodes in that category. And of course Sting heads up that group. WCW must fill out of the year with compelling or interesting main event matchups to draw and keep an audience. A strong heel champ could work his way through these guys, perhaps dropping and regaining it from one of them somewhere along the way, leading to the inevitable match with Sting. There is talent to have great matches and good storylines. During that time, which could be stretched to the summer of 1993, the promotion could work on either acquiring or developing some new heels who would then be ready to go after Sting. I think the failure of Sting as champion in 1990 and Luger in 1991 was that the promotion didn't think out what they were going to do once they put them over. After Sting got the title, his first and only feud was with the Black Scorpion. Fine idea, but they had no idea what they were doing all along and no idea who the next challenger would be and they ended up going back with Ric Flair, who they spent months trying to bury along the way. For Luger, they only had Ron Simmons to waste time until Sting. The public didn't buy that match. Luger Rick Steiner looked good on paper and was set up well but it did nothing to put the title over when they couldn't follow the undercard. 
WCW needs to look beyond a few months and draft out a plan for all of 1992 and much of 1993. Who would best fit the bill long-term as champion? What are the possible attractive matches we can make with that champion? As I said, for a babyface, the only viable heel right now is Root. All the other good heels are in the WWF. The best thing they could do is bring back Flair, but that's a moot point. After Flair, the best possibilities are Kurt Hennig, Randy Savage, and Ted DiBiase. Kijimuto is a candidate and a terrific wrestler, but one fears WCW wouldn't have a clue how to make it work. While I don't know the choice WCW should make, I do have this feeling Sting doesn't have enough opponents to keep the title picture interesting through the end of 1992. If I had to make the choice and of Steamboat win the title from Luger in February, eventually drop the strap to Rude, Hennig or DiBiase would be preferable if you could get them, in May. The heel champion could run through all the babyfaces and tease everything for Sting sometime in 1993. Would it work? I don't know. But what they've done in the past hasn't worked, either. John Williams. Pasadena, California.